So, welcome to Net Tuesday. It is 2013. Isn't that terrifying? I know, I know. So, really clearly, we're in the transition period. Um, 2013 means we're in a new venue. And the next two months will be in yet another venue. And then after that, a new venue. So, uh, so those of you who've been following know that our longtime supporters, uh, W2 Woodwards, are uh, currently struggling with the city and their finances to try and figure out how they exist in the world, which means we're going to go find some other homes for ourselves. So we are graciously and kindly hosted today by the Network Hub. Um, yes, really, I'm very grateful to them for stepping up on very short notice to give us a space to do this. And then for, for the months of February and March, we will be experimenting with another venue. So we're going to go and, and have a date with The Hive, which is another co-working space. Um, they're in Gastown, and I will send you the address, and you'll have all the details. And then after that, we're going to go and be very fancy and go hang out with our friends at SAP in the Executive Briefing Center. So, I don't know what it looks like, I'm going to find out tomorrow and check it out, but I think there's like video streaming crazy things going on in there. Um, and that will be a place where we host, actually Chad is curating a digital storytelling story event in April. Three quarters of them are here spying on us today, so. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, we're going to totally see how that works out. So once we've come through the spring and tried out a couple different venues, then I'll go to you guys and have a survey and say like, well, what worked? What did you like? Where do you feel like we found a proper home? But uh, so I basically say thank you for moving with us through our transitions through this spring. And uh, by the summer, we'll probably have a regular home again. And we'll see how it all plays out. So as I said, the network hub, if you are on one of those Twitter devices, you can tweet at the Network Hub and uh, tell them how much you really appreciate that they offer these kind of community spaces. Because, as I'm now learning, it's really important to have reliable community spaces. This can help you. Um, as you can see, this is total leap speak. It makes me feel like I'm in junior high again. Um, that's a capital N. That's a zero. That's a capital H. The rest should be pretty clear. Um, Anyone need that? But if your hands, otherwise I'm going to keep moving. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's too hard. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> too much effort. Maybe your cell phone now is going to work. Don't worry about it. I know. So, uh, yeah, we're Net Tuesday. We're all over the internet at Net Tuesday. So simple. Um, we've got a little hashtag, NT Band, and we've got a website. So, uh, if this is your first time here, hands up. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, welcome new people. So are all you guys new friends, are you guys on Meetup? Like, how, is that how you're, because if you're not there, you should either get on there, or if you are politically against Meetup for some reason I don't know about, then there's also an email sign-up form at nettuesday.ca, and I can communicate with you old school as well. That will totally work out. But you should totally sign up, because then I'll tell you about the cool things that we're doing every month, and if I don't have you on my list, You'll never find us because we're moving every week. <laughs> As I said, we're on Net Tuesday. Look, there's a little bird. Things you should know, I guess I should introduce myself. Hi there, my name's Eli. Hi, Eli. Hi there, hi there. <laughs> I'm the Net Tuesday organizer here in Vancouver. I've been doing it for about three and a half years, which makes me a very old man at this point. Thank you. Good. Volunteers, that's what it takes. Oof. Look, everyone in this room is like community minded. These are my people. This is why I do these events, because I get to surround myself by, by solid and true people. But you need to know a couple things. One, there are washrooms behind you, so uh, take care of yourself. And uh, you know, as I said, you can always sign up for email updates as well. And so what is this Net Tuesday thing? So big picture, it is a monthly meetup for the nonprofit technology community here in Vancouver. So uh, you're working for a nonprofit or on board or engaged in some kind of way, and you want to know about this crazy technology stuff? 
we're the right place. And if you are more on the technical side and you're looking for a way to bring your skills to the community or educate people because you're saying like, oh my god, people are doing crazy things and actually there are sensible, reasonable ways, let's all come together and learn from each other. Vancouver is now the second largest of all the Next Tuesday meetups. There are about 50 scattered across the world. We are like 1,300, 1,360 ish or so. It's crazy. Um, but as you see, we're going to get about 50 ish on an average month. But uh, if you are connected with an organization who says, I want to really reach an audience of like a civic minded, technology folk, you should talk to us about sponsorship. There's so many great opportunities. That food doesn't happen by itself. Right now it's happening because you guys are generously donating at the door. Um, but I would love to throw that into even bigger things, you know, get you guys all liquored up. We'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we talked about who's new, a big pile of you. I'm super excited about that, which means Mel has put together something kind of special and people are tickled about it. <laughs> Um, as I said, this is totally volunteer run. I've got a whole pile of volunteers here, including Jeff the camera guy, yeah. who <laughs> got stepped up today. Um, here's some photos of these people. If you see them, give them a quick kiss, because they are solid and true people. Um, they may throw me up front sometimes, but actually they're the ones doing the work. They're the ones like making the connections in our community. Can't do it without them. Uh, and speaking of can't do it without them, in the back you're going to see a new person named Owen. I know crazy spelling, but check it out, his name is Owen. Um, and he is a, kind of a master of the camera. So say you were looking to create some fancy videos, he might be your guy. I've worked with him at the David Suzuki Foundation in a number of capacities. He's solid, reliable, true, can't go wrong. All I'm saying is, Owen. <laughs> Um, we have also been really blessed to have photos by Linda for the last couple months. Um, she's not here, but we do have Jeff <laughs> filling in ably. Um, they'll be all over Facebook, so tag yourself and uh, tell people you were here. This is really going long. We are still looking for volunteers. There are so many roles you can fill. Um, we're always looking for like people who have like great event ideas, people who want to market, work on sponsorship, um, and of course. One of our long-term volunteers, Kelvin, is unfortunately otherwise occupied this year on Tuesdays, which means we're now looking for some people who might be interested in holding this community through social media. So if you are someone who like gets the nonprofit tech world, um, knows how to use that crazy hootsuite thing, and wants to give us a bit of time, you should talk to me afterwards, because uh, I think there's lots of great opportunities afoot. Now I get to stop, and uh, we actually get to talk to someone who's interesting and smart and clever. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mel from Litter. She is kind of amazing. She's also foreign, kind of. <laughs> so Mel is actually from here, and then went to school at UVic. But right after she graduated, she left us. She went to the uh, Silicon Valley of the Fens, which is a uh, Oh, I've now learned, otherwise known as Cambridge, jolly old England. So, uh, so every once in a while you're going to hear some funniness slip into her accent, but otherwise she'd want a bust at heart. <laughs> there you go. I was like, she's going to deny it. She's going to deny it. Um, Mel's going to talk to us a little bit about like mobile devices and applications and software and how you can use that to like affect real change in the world and, and open up new opportunities for people. So she's got a real strong background in working with adults with disabilities, and she has been focusing on how she can use those fancy devices to like really change the life of the people she's worked with. I got nothing more for you. Just have for you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, give it up! Hi. I'm Mel, and I have a really scratchy voice, so I apologize in advance, but I'll talk really loud and it'll just sound low and husky and whatever. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm Mel. So I like to say I, I'm a woman of many hats. 
Oh my so, God, before wait, before, what? You also need to know that she is one of the other Next Squared organizers. She is oh, yeah. one of those 50 people out there doing these kinds of events in her own community every year. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm one of the Net Squared organizers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Um, so, as Eli said, I am from Vancouver. Um, well, born in Calgary, raised in Langley. Um, but after uni, I went over to the UK and for one to two years, and it's been six and a half. Um, and I'm still there for one to two years, so you never know. Um, might come back one day. But Net Squared is um, a really great group, and one that I organize in Cambridge, very similar to what you guys are doing here, mixture of people. And one of my kind of clear passions in technology for social good. Um, Another hat that I wear that tends to encompass a lot of what I do is um, some friends and I started up an organization called You Can or the You Can Hub. Um, and it, it's kind of what it says in its name. We believe in what people can do, not focusing on what they can't. Um, so connecting people to help them make their impossible possible. Like I said to Eli early, not difficult at all, right? Making the impossible possible, easy. So within that, we do quite a few things. So give, to give you a tangible uh, example, there's You Can Bike 2 is one of our projects. It's not technology-based, um, unless you consider a bicycle technology. It's kind of tech, yeah. Um, but basically, young man with, um, with Down syndrome really wanted to cycle with his family and friends, couldn't do that on a two-wheeler for physical reasons. Um, so we connected him with some other amazing cyclist people. Cambridge is like bikes everywhere, by the way. Um, and they created a project with the, all these amazing side-by-side -side and adult, adult trikes and all these amazing bikes that people can rent in the, one of the parks there. So that's just an example of us connecting people to help this one individual and all the other people that come to, the, come to the, rent the bikes. They might have disabilities, they might not, um, to essentially achieve what they thought was impossible. Um, where tonight's talk comes in is around um, technology and mobile technology in, in particular. Do you guys say mobile technology over here? Because it's cell phones, not mobile. I was just thinking about that earlier. We call it mobile. You would say mobile? OK, yeah. good. Yeah. Good. We call it a cell phone. But it's mobile technology. OK, good. There you go. So clearly, that's one of my um, strong interests. And Get Tech is something that. Um, an event that I'm trying to run in Cambridge next year, or I will be running in Cambridge next year, around bringing the technology community together with the disability and older community to essentially create some amazing new stuff. And just to say that I have crazy other hats, I really like crafting and buttoneering is another little business that we started, because why not start more than one thing, right? <clears throat> so that's me, and that's me on Twitter, obviously. Um, so tonight is about, not about me being an expert in cell phones or in tablets. You guys probably know a lot of the similar stuff, but it's about starting a conversation. Um, because I strongly believe that having, now that we've gotten to the stage of having, you know, iPads and various other tablets and things, we have the potential to properly change the world, as cheesy as that sounds, for people that, you know, digital inclusion and all those other token words that are out there, like, we can properly change the lives of individuals, and it's just about people like you and I to start to think about how we could do that, even with, you know, your parent or your grandparents or your friend next door. Um, so tonight is about starting that conversation, and it's not about me being an expert, and it's not about me being working for Apple or anybody else. I talk about iPads a lot, by the way, just because I have one and I like it. Um, but I, I, I tend to uh, not get into the debate of which device is best. So to start us off, I want you guys to do some talking tonight as well. So how many people, actually, how many people have a smartphone? Hands up. Pretty much most people. Not quite everybody, that's OK. Um, a tablet, so an iPad or something similar, Android. Yeah, brilliant. OK, so what do you use it for? Angry birds. Angry birds. <laughs> that, I was waiting for how long that would take to, for us to get there. I'm going to make a little mind map as we go, and I'll tell you what this app is after. So, so we've got angry birds. What else? 
Dat bedoel. Hij Brilliant, Wikipedia. Flipboard, yeah, I'm going to show that one to you. I love that one. Yeah, note taking, Evernote. Yeah, Evernote or whatever note taking one you like. Yeah, what else? Recipes, good one. Recipes, we'll go with that. Reading. And there was one in the back, Owen? Splash Talk. What's that? Okay. Cool. Excellent. I learned something. I'll have to look it up. What else? So these are a lot of apps and stuff that you're using. What is the what purposes are you using it for? Writing. Writing, yeah. I love it. I love it. Social networking? Yeah. News. Yeah. Tell me your ride, not yet. This is still interesting. <laughs> what? <laughs> Terrible video. Oh my lord, the very worst, yeah. Yeah. Like making Yeah, making terrible videos. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's don't Interesting video, admission. <laughs> okay. Drawing and sketching, good one. Yeah. Organization. When I first bought my iPhone, it was one of the first ones, and it was literally because I have a horrible memory, and I needed, if my, if my schedule changed throughout the day, I would forget I had a meeting. Literally, I'd remember two hours before, and then two minutes before, I'd forget. So the phone, I knew, would remind me to go to my meeting. And that's literally the only reason I bought it. Obviously, I use it for a lot more now. Uh, so this app, this app is called Poplet. P-O-P-P-L-E-T. It is written on the top, but not very easily read readable. There you go. Pop it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it streamlines, streamlines your lifestyle. I like that. Bus times. Mm -hmm. Bus times, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is there like an app for the... Yeah. Yeah, buses here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it? Trent have an app itself? Yeah. I'm going to write that down for me to remember. As I said, I have no memory. There's two ways. It will tell you the times at that stop, or it will tell you where the bus actually yeah. is. So that's huge. That's incredibly useful. So then Google Maps is good too, because they have the bus. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Google Maps is another one, actually. Well, I think we've got wayfinding, but I'll put Google Maps anyways. No find your keys. Interesting. There you go. So in some ways it kind of like does our brain stuff for us, which is amazing. So as you can see, like this is probably, we could probably spend the next two hours having this conversation, right? But we're not, 
well, we are going to have the conversation, but we're not going to keep on this particular one. But look at like the few things that you guys have put up there in such a short period of time. There's so much there. And we can post this later for people and stuff as well. But this is, um, while I'm on the app, one of my favorite apps, I'm a mind mapper, visual, visual learner. So Pocket is one of my favorite, though it's not a traditional mind map. It's amazing to use. It's quick, as you can see. Um, you can take pictures within an app or like within one of the, oops. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can take a photo, which is not going to be of anything right now. There you go, there's me. <laughs> and stick it right in there. Um, change the colors, etc. So I'm a big fan, like especially if I go to a conference or something, and some I could take a picture quickly of the slide that I really like, so I can remember it later. And so, just an example. So that's Poplet. Uh, these fancy, fancy pants-looking slides are in Prezi. I highly recommend that as well. It's not difficult, even though it looks like it is. It's nice and easy, and makes you look really smart. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's Prezi, but anyway, so that's what we've kind of used it for. So a lot of different things, right? Could you live without your phone now that you have one? No. You probably could, to be fair, <laughs> but it'd be much more difficult, wouldn't it? It's, and I've had, I've had that before where mine didn't work or whatever. Um, these are a few of my favorite things. I'm not going to sing, but, um, <laughs> and most of, them, <laughs> most of them have been said, actually. So Poplate, we just used Evernote. Anybody want to explain what Evernote is? For those that I'm guessing don't know what it is? Synchronized note-taking. Yeah, essentially. So I've got my phone in my pocket. I remember that I need to get some milk at the store. I'll type it in, and I can look at it on my computer later, or my iPad, or whatever. Supports photos as well as you know, voice memos. You can take a photo of a document and scan it. Yeah. So that's a good one. Um, Instagram, I'm guessing most people maybe know what that is. Photo taking, it posts it automatically on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. Um, Dropbox, one of the best business apps out there. Um, it essentially is the cloud. Everybody understand when I talk about the cloud? Okay, so essentially this virtual place where everything's stored. Um, Dropbox is good for that. Uh, Flipboard, let's have a look at Flipboard because Someone mentioned it already, and I find it amazing. So Facebook, Twitter, blogs, whatever you're following, it turns it into a really nice way of looking at, it, of looking at them. So it's like a magazine. It's like, it's like literally picking up a newspaper, your own personalized one. So let's say I like handheld learning, so I've made a section on that, and I can look at all the tweets on handheld learning. And they'll show me a little that it's very pictorial. So again, as a visual learner, I like that. So you, and then you can click within them and read them more. So that's Flipboard. This reminds me of the Windows 8 tile. Yeah, yeah, similar, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of things do, actually. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pinterest. It's not just a mobile thing, but I'm a girl, and <laughs> Pinterest is like amazing. Um, basically, a board full of pictures. Recommended, especially if you're getting married, redecorating your house. Uh, <laughs> any of those things. There's lots of other more, pr more product, productive ways of using it too. But um, Comic Life? Yeah. 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 Love Comic Life. I wish I could pick this up without, um, without disconnecting it. But Comic Life is essentially a way to like really easily make comics. In fact, look, I even started making one about this trip. So I just quickly took a picture and then it stuck it in there. And then it has some words that I can edit and change. And it's a really great way of like, especially if you're like with your kids or something, you want to like remember what you're doing. We, you know, we could do a quick one of tonight, but I won't be able to take your picture, so it won't be hard. But you can add things in. Et cetera. So yeah, Comic Life is great. Pages and stuff like that? Sorry? You got multiple pages? Or yeah, you can add more pages and stuff in, yep. Yeah, it's a great way to tell a story, I think. And stories are a way that people remember things, so. storyboarding as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Comic Life is great. It's a, I think it's an Apple's, well, Apple originally, well, I don't know if they built it, but they bought it. Um, I like that guitar tree. What's that about? 
<laughs> you're, you're looking at all the rest of them. Where's my guitar three? Oh, guitar free. I don't know. I think it teaches me how to play or something. I haven't looked at it in a while. It probably has. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not very effective if I don't look at it. And it also doesn't turn it the right way, which is annoying right now. Oh, it does for you. It doesn't for me. Um, yeah. There's guitar things on there as well. There's lots of guitar things, guitar, garage band, etc. But let's just see what else I had on my list there. Um, sketchbook, someone mentioned sketching. Someone back there mentioned sketching. Sketchbook I love. Um, I can't draw, but I like to pretend I can on it. Um, if I can find it. Problem with having too many apps. So a sketchbook actually lets you have layered drawings. So like you wouldn't, oh, that's a really bad one. Sorry. <laughs> Don't say that. So, <laughs> yeah, Eric's my husband, by the way. <laughs> Embarrassing. So there's a few that I've made, like just random like little logos you're fiddling with or whatever. You can literally like, it's better with a stylus, but literally like draw on it and you can have layers. And if you like to fiddle, it's a good one. Um, anything else on there of interest? Epic win. Yeah, really fun. It's like making a game out of task lists. So like you literally like say, uh, finish my presentation for Net, Net Tuesday. And when I finish it, I push a button. It goes, makes this amazing win the noise and goes, epic win. And it's like, <laughs> and you go along a path and you get to achieve different things. Of course, you make things up so that you can get further. But anyways. <laughs> I didn't actually make one for tonight. I'm going to have to do that. I don't know. I'll have to see. You get points and stuff. It's just making a game out of life, which I'm always a big fan of. Um, so, yeah, that's that, really. Uh, Yammer, if you're interested in social media, it's like a... It's not just an app on the here. It's on the computer as well, but it's essentially social media for businesses, so you can have an in internal kind of Facebook page. Not page. Facebook. Facebook, essentially for yourself. It's not Facebook. They'd hate me saying that, but um, it's an interesting one to look up. So those are just a few of my favorite things. Um, but now imagine putting that into the hands of a child who's learning or into the hands of someone who doesn't communicate with their voice or into the hands of your grandma or your parents, or your uncle. Yeah, someone who maybe doesn't use the computer all the time. There's so much potential, and that's what we're going to look at. So tablets and smartphones. So education, communication, and independence. These are the three main things that, I, that at least I feel tablets and smartphones can help people achieve, essentially. The three areas. So education. So think back to when you were, I don't know, 12. Yeah, what was school like? What kind of tools did you have in the classroom? Pens. Pens. Pencils. Pens. Pencils, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Chalk. Graphs. Chalk. Oh, the chalk things at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hot crust buns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What else? Oh, wow. OK, interesting. Somewhat technology advanced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably was back in. And what was the format of a classroom? They're all facing forward. Like this? Like yeah. There's no computer. With the windows on the right side. Oh, well, windows, hopefully. So it would be rather dark in there. Yeah, in a line, teacher up front people out there. Yeah? Exactly. So do you remember encyclopedias? Yeah? Amazing, like volumes of encyclopedias. Literally, that's the only information you had to get stuff out of. Like, how limited is that? You couldn't change, like, they probably changed it every year or something, right, and updated it. But actually, there's just such limited information. Why are you waving at me? 
I know yearly we would have been lucky to have those updated every 10 years. Yeah, oh, okay, years. fair enough. Not every year in the school, but they probably did update them every year. Obviously, pens and pencils. I don't know if you guys had to write, like, probably only half my school, given my age, but I had to write my essays out and all the whiteout and stuff. Like, it took forever. Just so limited, right? So then computers came in, and we started having computer classes. So you'd learn how to use the computer, as if the computer is the end result. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, then computers came in. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, but computer, cl computer classes did come into schools. I think I was more like a typewriter class in my school, but anyways. Um, where you literally, like, did anybody else used to have to do ASDF, JKL, semicolon as fast as you could? That was me, right? And actually, okay, that's teaching me the skills that the theory behind it is at work you're going to have to use a computer, so you learn a few things about the computer. But they didn't really use them other than that. They use them as devices on their own. So that's just talking about the fact that you had someone up front, teacher, students. And this still happens. But along came mobile technology. So all of a sudden, people were bringing their cell phones to school, or schools were buying them in some very wealthy cases. Um, and it, just start, it started to change the way that people are thinking about things, about how we teach, how we educate. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have all these other like blogs and everything else, and teachers are starting to use this in class. So the class project might be to create a blog about World War II or something like that and find articles and research on the Internet. And this, the information is now endless of where we, where we can get stuff, but also how we can contribute to the world by giving information to not just our classroom. Although some people do internal blogs as well, that's fine. But there's just so much potential. And it's worldwide. So we have information at our fingertips. There's the potential for social learning, not just within the class, but someone could find, some 13-year-old could find me on Twitter and ask me about iPads or something, and I'd be able to give them the information. Like, what a world. And they might be from, I don't know, I can't think of a country right now. <laughs> I was going to say Egypt. Who knows? Um, and self-directed learning potential. So instead of me having to teach everything, they get to go out and find it themselves. So just to give you a bit of a flavor of that, there's something called the flipped classroom that I wanted to show you, which hopefully will work. I'm Aaron Sand, and I teach science here at Little Park High School. My ultimate goal, I guess, as a teacher is to help students become learners who can learn for themselves and by themselves. One of the problems that I was guilty of even prior to flipping my classroom around was the classroom was centered around me. I told them exactly what to learn, how to learn it, what assignments to do to learn it, and when to learn it, and how to prove to me that they learned it. I don't do that anymore. We changed the, the plates in which content is delivered. Instead of standing in front of the class and delivering, here's how you do this type of problem, here's how this works, um, I deliver that direct instruction now asynchronously at home through these videos that we make with Camtasia Studio. I'm still home. Oh, we didn't do that last time. The last time. step, they were already whole numbers. We had one, one, and four. Yeah. Here, we don't have a whole number. So here's a few little tricks when you need to multiply by whole numbers. If one of your numbers ends in 0.5, you're going to multiply by two. Right. Something 0.5 times it by two. Right. Okay. Write this down, guys. Yes. If something ends in 0.3 or 0.33 or 0.66, you multiply by three. And when kids come to class, they don't show up to learn new stuff. They show up to apply the, the things that they learn at home and to ask me questions about the things they learn at home. So now they can have my, my lesson, if you will, where I would normally have stood up and lectured to them in class with some added features they get that at home. Then what they were expected to do for, uh, for homework is now what they do in my class. Life is different for me because I don't. I no longer am the guy who stands up in the front of the classroom and just yak to the student for an hour or what, however long the class is. Now I walk around the class and I help kids. I, I'm a tutor. I'm a guide. I'm uh, the putter outer of fires. Whatever it happens to be um, in my crazy chemistry class, I walk around and do that. I don't stand up front and teach. I'm the kind of the traditional model. I'm Aaron Sands. I'm a teacher. I'm a dad. 
I'm a husband, and I love Campaign Speak. Thoughts? I wish I thought so. Cool, huh? Yeah. Like completely flipped and reversed. Do you think you'd, well, I think I would learn so much more if I could do that. What about us lazy people who need to have someone like standing there with a stick for us to do anything? <laughs> well, you, <laughs> there's an app for that. Yeah. <laughs> stick app, <laughs> carrot or stick. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, and that's one of the challenges. And every theory of teaching is going to have a challenge, right? Um, but, you know, especially so, I couldn't find the video or a video on one of the universities doing it, but I thought about my university days, and they were, this teacher just literally sent out videos of his lectures. You do them in advance. It was somewhere in the States. You do them in advance. You watch them. You come to class and ask them questions. So then the risk is, oh, well, what if you don't go to class? Then you don't ask questions. That's your own fault. It doesn't matter. If you're not the person that needs to ask questions, you can just watch them at home and get on fine and still pass your class instead of class being 60% attendance or whatever, right? Um, where you might not have learned anything while you were there. So it's just an interesting concept, and I, can't, I, I don't at all claim that mobile or technology is the only reason these theories are coming out, but I think that they definitely contribute to it, and I think it's quite exciting. Um, this video is called The Flipped Classroom, <laughs> easily enough. But I can, um, I can send out the links and stuff. Yeah. Oh, well done. Easy peasy. Do, are you on Twitter at all? Is that going to be a good way to get it? Can we do it elsewhere as well? Twitter? Yeah. Okay. You'll still get it. Excellent. There you go. There you go. So we'll make sure the videos are on it. Yeah. I'm sure you're gonna get to this point anyway because obviously the yeah. archive is going, but one of the things about the standard and different teaching model that you have downside is great for pushing that information and being measurable in the end. Yeah. But it produces a culture of people who wait for somebody else to come to the answers. Yeah. So it fosters that sense of well, I have ideas, but I'm not the authority, so I'm gonna yeah. wait for the those in power to do it and it doesn't happen well, that's not ideal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, if, if and when you went to university, after high school, I was completely shocked because I actually had to do something. <laughs> I actually had to learn myself on my own time instead of just study for a test. Um, and I, yeah, I, I completely agree. And not that universities do it perfectly either, but it's, it's a way to get you to think more, to question the world. Definitely. I wonder... I got to watch, a long time ago, I, I got to watch an early attempt at this where there was a, an electronic board. It was really a, a touch screen, uh, except that it used a projector to project on the screen. Okay. And they used Interactive dry, whiteboard? Dry felt pen. Yeah. yeah the whiteboard, but no ink. Yeah. And then the projector would project the ink. Yeah. Um, and I saw this in a classroom, and uh, um, so it was physically mounted, and some of the kids had to stand on... Uh, um, yeah, because they, they couldn't reach. Yeah. And also, um, the optical character recognition, so the, the kids would write things that I could read as a human, and then they would have to circle it and do things to it, and then the board would say, I have no idea what you wrote. And so this child yeah. was being shamed. In, yeah. In perfectly like yeah, yeah. So uh, my, my thought there was that the early attempts, that there were all sorts of glitches, and I wonder if you had anything to comment about from your many experiences about getting it right and how, how long it takes and testing. Yeah. I mean, I think my main comment about that is interactive whiteboards had a big push for a few years. They were the most exciting thing out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, actually, now iPads and other tablets are the exciting thing that are out there because each individual or partner or two people or whatever can have an iPad in their hand and they can write that stuff on there. And that you can even get apps where it then turns it into an interactive whiteboard, well, sort of, up front. That's mobile. You can bring it wherever you go, where those interactive whiteboards are very much, this is the wall that it stays on. And in terms of working with people with disabilities, up, down, there's, you know, and, it, and they're pricey. Like, you think iPads are pricey. <laughs> those are pricey. Um, but in terms of the actual technical detail of that, 
I don't really have an answer for that. I think it's just a learning curve. People, you know, the software engineers and various people that are building it are learning as they go. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. But, um, and this is what I want to press over and over again. The device itself is not the end result. It doesn't matter if you have an iPad in your classroom if you don't know what to do with it. It doesn't matter, like, and an iPad isn't right for every situation, or a tablet isn't right for every situation. However, if we think about what we're trying to achieve in the world, which in this case is educating young children to the best ability so they can live life to their fullest, then, then we think, okay, how, the question should always be, how could technology help us achieve that, whatever the technology might be? That's just what I press all the time, and that's why I avoid the conversation of which technology is best, because it depends what outcome you're trying to achieve. Yeah? I was just wondering, do you know of any cases where children have actually been involved, or the target group has been involved in the creation along the steps along the way? Because I know sometimes when we're thinking about it, um, sometimes, you know, the, the actual case study every, along the way, do you know of any cases? Like creating an app, you mean? So or something like that? Yeah, there's a few things like that happening out there. Um, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't know a Canadian one, but I know like in London there's one called, I think, Apps for Good. And that's literally a project that goes around to schools. And they're quite impoverished schools as well. Um, and they create, they work with young girls to create apps, essentially. So it's right from scratch, find a problem. Okay, how can, how can an app help solve that? Okay, do your market research and literally help them build an app. And there's are, there are a few things like that out there. Um, I could send some links that I know about if you want. Yeah. yeah. Code for America. What for America? Code. Code for America, yeah. There you go. Code for America. So that's just a little touch on education. Um, just to start to get us to think a little bit differently about how people might be able to learn. So the next is communication. And this is coming um, in order to do that, I, to talk about it, I want to tell you a few stories. So coming from my background in the disability side of things. So speaking of learning, communication is key to learning. If you can't communicate in whatever way it might be, it's really difficult to learn. Communication doesn't always have to be verbal. Um, but in some way, people have to learn. That's a horrible color on there. Note to self. So. This is Charlie, okay? Charlie's 12 years old, yeah? Regular boy, goes to school, mainstream school. Um, he loves soccer. He loves trains. He loves computers. Typical boy stuff. Um, but he doesn't like loud noises, looking you in the eye, speaking verbally. Or he might have a challenge speaking verbally. Um, anybody guess what the disability might be there, by the way? Autism, Autism yeah. Yeah, or Asperger's on the, on, on, on the autism spectrum, speaking of speaking verbally. Um, so that's Charlie, right? That's him as a whole person. So Charlie went to school, and he doesn't speak verbally. Imagine what that's like, right? You can't get what you're thinking out of your mouth, right? And I'm just going to skip to the next one for a second. And the solution for that for a very long time was literally paper boards, essentially, with graphs. So, like, if you imagine these are inside of a square, they're literally papers, graphs of, like, good, bad, apple, orange, whatever it might be. And he would point to the ones, like, you know, the teacher would help him point to the ones that he wants to say out loud. But here's what happens, though, with that, is if someone says to him, do you want an apple? or an orange, either with a board or a physical object, he would get angry and refuse to respond. OK, so you're thinking, oh, this, he's, just, he's just being difficult, right? Actually, he didn't want an apple or an orange, right? Like, <laughs> so that's the trouble with what it was like, and often what still happens, actually. So then what also happened with these boards is can you imagine all the words in the human language that he might want to say? You literally are walking around with luggage, suitcases full of boards. And teachers are like, hold on a second, let me find the right one. 
here you go, is that it? Oh, no, next one, right? Not exactly ideal. So then, technology started to advance, and some new devices came out, where they're specifically adapted devices for people, for communicating. Um, and that's great. They started, people started to use them, fantastic. People, Stephen Hawking has an amazing one that helps him. And there's lots of other things out there. But what I struggle with is that they are pricey. Really, really, really pricey, like thousands pricey, right? That's one of the issues I have with it. The other is they shout out, look at me, I have a disability. I have something different than all the rest of you. Okay, and that, that never really sat well with me. And there are certain situations with maybe some more complex disabilities and things that that might be the case right now and still be needed. But there's still this challenge of shouting out, I have a disability. So then it came along one device that could do it all. Yeah? You can do all of those things that you could on that, those specific devices, adapted devices, on your iPad, on your phone. They can have boards that they can communicate with, with endless words and pictures that they took of their kettle that they want to talk about, or whatever it might be. <clears throat> and it says, look at me, how cool am I? I've got an iPhone in my pocket. Like Eli is really cool over there. Um, <laughs> and never underestimate the power of cool, as especially as a child, right? Instead of people staying away because you're different, they're going, oh, what's that? What are you doing over there? And they're curious because they want to play on it too. So these are just a few to remind myself of what to show you. You can't read it because I wrote it in silly blue, but um, I'll show you some of these apps just to give you an idea. So this is ChoicePad. Let's make it a bit bigger for you to see. Okay, so this is like the ones they would have had a paper before, right? They'd have, I think this is done in Makaton style. Um, so it's this very specific type of drawing that the child might have been raised using. Um, I'm going to need to turn my Twitter off. Anyways, um, <laughs> you can know everything that's happened. It's like a live feed, actually, except of the rest of my life, too. Um, <laughs> so you have this, and you press. So I, I say, I go drink. I go drink. Right? You get to say what you want. You can take, this is a very limited board, because I haven't paid for the more expensive version, but... Um, you can literally take a picture of your friends and put their name under it. So when you're talking about your friend, you can push their name on there and you can organize things in ways that work for you. So just imagine the potential there for a minute. Another one, uh, similar, tap to talk. I want to play with a ball where it's a whole sentence, and you can add in your own as well. Um, and sometimes it's not that someone can't speak verbally all the time. Sometimes they can only, it takes a little longer, or they are a bit shy about it and do it at home only. So you could record your own voice and be able to say it. Like, how cool would that be, right? And this is one of the people's favorites. So some of the... When I've kind of been thinking about this stuff, I've gone and met some people, so parents and children with disabilities, or parents with adult children with disabilities, and kind of just showed them my iPad to see what they think, what they do, and see how it works. Um, and this is one of their favorites, by far. And it's literally just because they like typing. They like, they like typing it out. So you can start typing. Hi. Everyone is... And like you should see on the right-hand side, there's actually, they're guessing what you're going to say, so you don't always have to type it out. So depending on your ability and whether you understand that, that could be quite useful. And you've got the ones on the top as well, where you can just, um, you can just pick one. Can't pick one right now. Yeah. Whatever it might be, right? You can type whatever you want. Well. And then you can press speak. Uh, <laughs> Let's see how it says it. <laughs> Just in case you wanted to say that. Yeah. So that one's called verbally, and, and a lot of people like that. And 
Um, sometimes it works really well for people that are a bit more shy about just speaking verbally, um, depending on their, obviously, their ability of, of, of typing. But what people like, even that didn't know how to read and write very well, is they liked writing their word. They li liked writing their name and pressing it. And then it would say their name, and they get really excited. And actually, that's, that's enough. That's, that's what got them interested in it, right? You've got to start small steps. There's a company called Look Window, right? Yeah. Daily, and you can actually, when as you're typing, you can use uh, different characters to create emotions. Mm. So that uh, text to speech that you just showed uh, could actually be angry, happy, tired, sad, or whatever. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just with uh, simple, normal characters. Brilliant. Can you write that down? Uh, yeah, Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And these, like, literally are just a couple of the ones that I've chosen, just mainly because they have free apps sometimes, just to be able to show people and see how it works. Um, and, but there's so many out there, and some are better. Like, that was quite a, like, computer voice, wasn't it? Yeah. And some have much better voices than that. Um, in fact, I think yeah, the next so one's a video. One's nice British accent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, this next video is on Prologue to Go, which is one of the most popular ones out there. It's also one of the most expensive ones, but they do put a lot of work into it. But again, it's by, by expensive, right? So it's like a $150 app, which seems like crazy. But again, In app like world. talking big hunk of plastic boards. Thousands. Like thousands. Of thousands exactly. Of so you get an iPad and Prologue to Go, which double that. And then a lot of things to talk about, like being on Facebook or Twitter or email, yeah. Skype with grandma or whatever, right? So it's not a not like a watch, not single. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. So it's expensive is a very relative term. And like I said, it's way more, way less expensive than the, the other ones. So I thought you'd just like to see it in action with act an actual child with a disability. So I found a little video. Hopefully. I like how the kid's talking in the background, too. I, I like the raw footage. That's what she she said, Sabrina, because this is Max typing. He didn't have chicken fajitas. What, what does Kayla like to do? Chicken nuggets. Oh. Oh, you want to find the ketchup? My spaces. Go to, go to food. My food and drink. Food and drink. Go to dressing. Dressing. Okay, now where's the ketchup?
<laughs> Thoughts on that? Uh, do you think it's going to be helpful to them if they can visualize themselves saying those words? Can you say a bit more? Uh, yeah, because we built a technology like two or three years ago, yeah. uh, and uh, unfortunately we shelved it, uh, that you could take a picture of anyone and uh, it would turn it into uh, an actual uh, uh, avatar of yourself, mm -hmm. but, the, but the very lifelike and realistic. And using the same TTS technology, it could actually, it's, you could type anything you wanted and uh, it would talk back to you. You know, so it's like, it was like you could uh, be saying anything, anytime with any accent, you know. And so I, uh, now that I've watched this, I think um, if that would be helpful, children, it's something that we can easily implement in real life. Yeah. So, so I think when they're doing that, it, they yeah. see themselves saying that. Yeah. Instead of some girl with a... Yeah. yeah. I think it um, really depends on the individual, probably. And the only way you'd find that answer is to maybe do some user research, research yeah. essentially. Because, you know, an individual like Max might not be able to say that um, in order for it to be read back. Yeah. But some other people might be able to. So it's you know, it's really dependent no, need on... To say it. Oh, okay. He just needs to type it, or in this case, just using those buttons, yeah. and then he would see himself... Oh, like an words. avatar saying yeah, it back yeah. to him. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it's not going to be a wrong voice. All you need is just uh, uh, take, like, up to an hour of his voice, and the computer... Even if he's not saying voice. words that would be... No, it doesn't need to be speech. Okay. Just, just tone. Voices, just to get Interesting. Personality. Definitely some potential. Yeah, definitely some potential there. Um, and Microsoft has done amazing stuff with that uh, right now. You know, they, they, you, they can uh, take a few hours of your, uh, you talking something, and it can uh, speak in your voice mm -hmm. in any language. Brilliant, yeah. Either way, this whole thing, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as you can imagine, like... <laughs> So that just gets you thinking, doesn't it? Like, what is all the potential out there and what apps could be developed? That's not by no means perfect. And what I like about that video is that he did it wrong at one point. And then he went back and he got frustrated and then he did it again. Because that's, that's reality. Like, and that probably took him months to learn how to do that. Like, it's not like he's just going to pick it up and get it. He needs to, like, it's a slow process to figure it out, right? And some of the people I work ha have shown my iPad to think it's going to work right away. And I'm like... It's going to take a lot of work on your part to get them used to what, what the device is like and getting used to communicating, actually, verbally. But, but it is like what you show. My wife works through this with autism. And yeah. Uh, she literally had like a bag full of like, picks and yeah. right? and you know, like a binder for food and a binder for people. And yeah. Like, right? So it's like, it's, it's quite dense, right? Where exactly. Like, like, Where, yeah, he had took a while to go through all the folders, but they took a lot less time than for her to go through Over suitcases. Yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He knew where everything was. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, th that uh, interface could be uh, vastly improved. Yeah. But still, he was getting it because he's yeah. motivated. Yeah. And that's partly just how, like, so his, his mom would have created those folders in the order that she thought that yeah. they needed to be made in. So part of that's training, or maybe that's the way it worked best for him. Perfectly fine, right? So there's a lot of potential there. Um, oh, essentially for communication is... That's just a little touch on communication as well, but just to give you an idea of how these devices can really properly change, like give someone a voice, literally. Like how amazing is that? So the last one is independence. So that means quite a few things. I'm gonna focus on older people in this one, as promised earlier. But with computers, when you're introducing it to a new person, who's introduced a computer to someone who's never used it before? Yeah. Was it easy or hard? Or in between? Incredibly frustrating. Incredibly frustrating for... For me. And probably the other person, to be fair. Yeah, my grandma has a lot of patience. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Exactly. But it's really difficult, isn't it? And there's, there's this fear factor that's always there on the part of someone who's never tried it. Like, oh, what if I push the wrong thing? Or like a pop-up comes up and like tells them to do something. They don't know, pre press OK, press cancel. I have no idea what to do. 
And you could tell them that it won't do anything wrong, just push one, but actually it will sometimes on a computer do something wrong. So it, they're complex things. And the other thing, think about, you've got a mouse down here that's doing something up over here. That's actually a really big thought process to not look at your hand and what it's doing, but to actually look at the screen and figure out where this mouse thing is going, even if it's a good mouse, never mind if it's a horrible one. Um, so computers can be complex, though they're exciting and they, you know, if I was talking 20 years ago, probably would have been talking about them and all the potential, right? But we've moved on, or we have the potential to move on, to something that just works. So an iPad especially, you take it out of the box and it works. Like the fear factor might be there, but it, it still, they get over it much quicker and around the other side. And it just, it just starts working the way that it should, essentially. Something goes wrong, apart from dropping it, you're really not going to break it, are you? Like, you just push that home button. You just keep pushing that button and it'll get you back to the beginning and you can start again. And for someone that that's new with, I've found that that makes quite a big difference. So I want to introduce you to my neighbor. This is Peter. Um, and uh, to give you a bit of background, Peter, I went over to his house once. He's fantastic. He's like my surrogate grandparent, him and his wife in, in Cambridge, which is really nice to have, obviously. And I went over to his house once, and he said, uh, oh, I got a phone today. I said, oh, yeah. What kind of phone? He goes, an I something. I was like, an iPhone? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I think so. I was like, oh, which, like, which one? As if he'd know the answer to that. And um, and he went and got it, brought it out to me. It was like much more advanced than mine was at that point in time. It was like two ahead or something. Um, and I was like, oh, I think he's got the iPhone 4 is what, the one that he got. And um, I was like, oh, that's amazing, Peter. Like, wh why did you get this phone? And essentially, this video is going to tell you the answer to that. So I'm going to let you watch it. Ignore the UK focus, but... Exactly, yep. And Peter, since then, has, um, so his, his wife is quite immobile. She, she doesn't leave the house very much. And um, 
So we decided they should buy an iPad too, <laughs> like the best grandparents ever. And um, so I set it up for them and made sure it worked. And the main reason was because they wanted to use Skype. Yeah, they could have used it on a little phone, but they wanted to use Skype. I introduced it to them. They came to my wedding a couple years ago, and um, they met all my family and things. And my family live in Canada. And they're like, oh, well, we'll never see them again. I was like, well, I'm going to fix that for you. Came over to my house just on the computer, used Skype one time, and literally were like looking behind and like, I feel like you're right next door, she kept saying. I have a cup of tea together. And like, yeah. <laughs> um, and it was amazing. And they just like all of a sudden were like, yeah, Skype would be amazing. And their family got on board with it and stuff. And um, now they every night talk to their family and see their great grandchild. And, um, and it's really sweet. Like, it's just the routine now. You know, and they don't use it for much more than that. But actually, that's okay. Like this, you know, that in an, in itself is a huge outcome for them. Um, and I'm slowly teaching them some other stuff, which I'm going to show you. But um, keeping dementia at bay, like huge. Like, and that's him saying that. I in no way prompted him to say that. I promise. Um, but he just he just said, oh, I was like, oh, why do you want to? Why do you want this stuff? Because it keeps my brain active. I don't want to go, I don't want to get dementia. I don't want my brain to stop working. He's like an old, he used to be a cop and stuff. Like he, he's an active man. So. Do you know what? 81 years old, has three types of cancer, extremely active, and using gadgets. Incredible man. People who are really old, they remember when, in the 50s, when people got on ships and went to North America, and the feeling was, they're never coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then in the 70s, charter flights meant that people could go home once. Yep. You know, and, and now you can see them every day. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, I can't, I can't praise Skype enough. I'm a Canadian living in England, like, you know. One of the, the little boy that was on the video earlier is my nephew. And, you know, I get to see him grow up. It, it's incredible. There's Skype. We've had that conversation. Um, another one that I really think is, like, revolutionary is an app called Mindings. And Mindings is all about connecting families together, essentially, right? So this is literally what it looks like. So that's Elias again, a little bit older. Um, and I have, that's an Instagram picture that I posted for Peter. So Peter has this on his iPad, okay? But Peter doesn't have to do anything with it. It just arrives. It's like a digital photo frame that's smart, okay? So I can Instagram, tweet, Facebook, email, text, and it will just show up on his screen, like a digital photo frame, um, if, he had, if he opens it, um, which a lot of people using this app will literally just have the device just for the app. But um, anyways, and he gets to see what I'm up to over here. I send him, pic send him pictures of my family all the time. And then, um, and then in the corner, you've got a little got it button. And he can say, oh, I got your picture, essentially. And then I'll get a message that says that I, he liked my picture or whatever. Um, so I want to take like one feed or can I say I want, you know, these eight people? So then you can add more people in, exactly. So you can add family members. So I haven't gotten to that point with him. It's just a new thing for him, but it's me right now. But I'm going to get his, hopefully his, um, you know, grandchildren and stuff doing it and um, like adult grandchildren. And, uh, you know, it's just incredible what he can see. And I've got a little video that actually, they're like promotional video. This is a UK, like it's a, it's a startup right now. And it's a subscription service is how they work, essentially. But um, it's still a pretty decent price. And this is actually, I should say, this is Stuart. And he's the, um, he's the guy that's developed it. And he didn't develop it because he wanted to develop an app. He developed it because his dad lives in Scotland and he lives in London. Oh. And his dad doesn't leave the house very much. Uh, he wanted to be able to check in on him and make sure he was alive, literally, uh, without necessarily always having to pick up the phone. 
but also he wanted to be able to send pictures of his, his child's and that grandchild's birthday as it happens, instead of, I was just having this conversation earlier, instead of um, printing out pictures, sending them in the post, he gets to do it right away, in, in the moment. And I'm always a big fan of apps that are developed from a need, not because we want to develop things. Come on, work. Your granny lives in Canada. Wouldn't it be great if you could see the folk? That's so far away from the UK folk, by the way. As it's happening. How can you make sure Uncle remembers his doctor's appointment next week? Don't you wish you could text Mum in hospital just to let her know you're thinking about her? And isn't it a shame that some of the people most important to you can't share the tweets, Facebook status? Flickr photos, Instagram pictures, and all that other stuff you share with your more switched on friends. Introducing Mindings. Mindings lets you effortlessly share meaningful moments with your family from your mobile phone. Personal captioned photos, text messages, calendar reminders, and much more appear instantly on a digital photo frame that you'd never even touch. Mindings is in the cloud. That means there's no software to manage. We'll keep adding new features, and you can keep sharing your life with your loved ones in ever more ways. Just wait until you see what we're already working on. We'll help you make sure Granddad never forgets a birthday, a coffee morning, or a bowling tournament. By giving their calendar, you can update from your phone. What about Skyping Granny without having to teach her how to use a computer? Or you could connect a device to your minding screen and see your weight or blood sugar levels on the ground. And how reassuring would it be to get a message first in the morning telling you that Dad had switched his kettle on? Then you would know it was okay. A minding is a gift you give to someone just to let them know you're thinking about them. It's about caring. Yeah, and that's one of my that's one of the my missions essentially is to talk to so many of the developers and things and make them realize that more isn't always better. Yeah. Yeah. And he's he's in an interesting position because he's trying to get this funded as well. So you have to have a certain amount for investors to want to give you anything it's a real it's a real challenge but that being said I think he is aware of that and very like hesitant like I've had that conversation with him as well um, but what potential like it almost makes me well up every time I look at that like it's just so much potential to properly get people seeing what connecting with their families essentially like I um, but one of the challenges of it that I've run into so I got all excited I'm like hey I'm gonna set this up with my grandma and my grandma lives in like a independent living, so she's got her own little space, but food and stuff is all done downstairs with everybody else. Um, and she's, def she's she, it's funny talking to her about computers and showing her what I'm doing and stuff. Um, so she's not really into computers and stuff, but I, th I think she'd get on with this okay. The biggest challenge, I literally was like, oh, I'll buy her something, whatever, we'll get it all set up, we'll pay for a subscription. And the challenge is, how much it costs to get internet in your house. Oh, exactly. I was like, I'm not paying $40 a month or something ridiculous just so my grandma can use this when she won't use it for anything else. Yeah. And you don't know if she's going to use it and get on with it, well with it and stuff. Um, and there was no other option. So this is the, the hurdle that I'm trying to get over at the moment. Um, so, Would anyways. She be inspired by that technology to perhaps explore other 
Maybe. Yeah. And that and that's the potential going for and there's tons of potential, isn't there? Yeah. So I th the solution <laughs> the solution we've actually come up with is <laughs> is um, to get it in my mom's house because my mom is really intrigued by it. She doesn't do Facebook and all those things. And my mom's like in her 50s, you know, she's, she's not that old. Um, but she's really intrigued by the app, so we're going to set it up there. And then every time grandma goes over, we'll see if she's interested in it, and then we'll go take it from there. But yeah. Actually, he's first. Yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I think has been used quite often in the previous device or the other way of barriers to access is community based Wi Fi networks. Mm. So, in other words, if there's accessibility as an issue, it's like, huh, it's like a co op group can find a way for people to access the network and yeah. administrate the bandwidth. Yeah. Right? yeah, and within like you know, an independent living place, like the potential is huge there. They actually have, like, the silly thing is they have Wi-Fi there, but it's only downstairs and not in people's rooms. I'm like, well, why don't you just have some hubs so that you can get it in everybody's room? So, we'll get there. <laughs> we will. <laughs> there may also be the possibility to bundle, um, or to, you know, depending on how the price point is regulated, to get, you know, British Tel to, to say, if you're a senior and you don't yeah. You know, then we'll subsidize you for two years at ten yeah. pounds instead of fifteen or whatever. Yeah, definitely. So that's the, the next step, anyways. But there there are solutions, but those there, there are those barriers in place to kind of hurdles to leap over. So so that's minded, anyways. Just to get you, I just I really think that's the future, and it really like encompasses what the potential is, especially with people in that age group. So kind of conclusion, really. So. The three reasons why I think that um, tablets, smartphones, and things are really, really exciting is that they're portable, which means they're community-based. They go with you. You don't have to go to learn computer in a room. You can bring it with you and learn it wherever you want. This is Angela. So the UCAN hub, we have socials every month at the pub, which some people with disabilities come along, some people not. Like It's a real mix of a community. Um, but I always have my iPad there just because it's fun, and it engages her in conversation. And she's playing Labyrinth on there, a really fun game on the iPad, by the way, and literally has to like t tilt the screen and stuff. And she was so excited about doing this. And it got people, like other people, they like, oh, what are you doing over there? And got people engaging with her, where sometimes at the socials where someone might not, never have met someone with a disability before, they're a bit shy, not sure what to do, how to act. It, in it gives people an excuse to actually start communicating and engaging with each other. So anyway, it's portable and community-based. <clears throat> They're fun. Key, like really key. They're fun. And they're easy to use. That's Elias again. I like his pictures anyways. But that's him with my iPhone at one point in time um, when he was only like nine months old. And he didn't do much on it, let's be honest. He liked to eat it. There's other pictures of him eating it. But, um, <laughs> But he did, like, he, did, he did get the concept that he's going to touch this screen, and, um, and it was quite interesting to watch him, actually. And he's uh, two now, and I had him playing with my iPad yesterday, and he was loving that, like, seriously loving it. Like, played, uh, what's it called? Ninja, something ninja. ninja. Thank you. <laughs> Fruit Ninja. <laughs> Best child app ever, like, little, little child, because he's just like, Ch -ch -ch -ch. he's going at it. Um, but anyways, it's easy to use, like, a baby can use it, you know, to an extent. Um, a two-year-old, he definitely could. He knew how to slide it and unlock it and find the app, and he was very intelligent. So education, communication, independence, tablets essentially are gadgets for good. But my mission, especially in the disability side, is to change it from, hi, I'm Charlie and I have a disability, to change that to just, hi, I'm Charlie. So last note, technology is literally just a tool, so how are you going to use it, essentially?
think we we'll get really caught up in some like you know the the advocacy marketing stories and, and I think like these stories have really direct impact in changing people's lives in these tangible ways and helping them communicate is yeah. ooh we gotta do more of that but yeah. right? people have leads please talk to me because I want to tell more stories like that and really expertly told so thank you now. And the story is like the key part of it is those stories are nothing that were that were anything special to me. You guys can do all of those things. Like I'm not an expert in it. It was simply using Skype with an older person. You know, so go home and get your grandma on your little device there and see what see how she gets on. I need a dongle too. I think it's interesting how the education and communication and independence are so intertwined that I commend you on separating them out. Oh, it's hard. This guy went into independence. I know. I know. But, you know, this idea of um, lifelong learning makes you independent, gives you, allows communication, communication, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I'd be, pardon me, I'd be really interested in people are doing any work around this or hoping to do work around this, like talk to me about it because I'm really interested in what's going on in the kind of Vancouver area and, and helping people in whatever way I can literally get to the next step. So it did sound like there are people who are in, involved in this world. I know for certain like you've got Chad as another actually in the room expert around. Yeah, you don't have to go to Cambridge to, to do this. You can come to Burnaby. <laughs> Yeah, I work for a nonprofit, Neil Squire Society, whose mission is to help people with disabilities use technology. So if you want to help someone do something like this, I can get you set up. We do local tutoring and also online tutoring for people in their homes all throughout Canada as well. Yeah, and if you want to become a tutor, there may well be opportunities for you as well. Oh yeah, no, if, uh, if, if you got time, I got work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, have you also had like, a bit of software development? So what was your name again? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, and so and what you are, like, sounds like you've had some kind of work around accessibility, or you've had some thinking around it? No, actually, uh, we built it for something else, because uh, uh, initially we wanted to build something uh, so uh, you can speak in every language without having to learn those languages. Right. But uh, now that I was watching the video, I just realize that the same technology could easily be used for the same purpose of helping uh, those kind of people and uh, and the good thing about it is that right now the technology is way more advanced than uh, when we built that three years ago so you can wow. easily you know it's going to cost you and i can tell you how it's going to cost you like a few hundred bucks and you can have a website uh, that you can service like thousands of people like that so uh, Noah's all like, I don't know, I might have 45 minutes of material, um, but she really drew the stories out of you today, so uh, so here we are, like we've got five minutes left, so let's uh, let's dive through this thing so I can send you all home and you guys can, you know, hang out with your loved ones. Bit of like a moral of the story today. So let's really go through saying we're going to be talking in a month's time on February 5th. And we're going to go through some hands-on examples of creating maps from the data you already have. And so actually Mac will come in and he'll start off with stuff we could do ourselves. It's like basically you take Google's free fusion table and like and some free data sources or stuff you may already have and say like, let's throw all my donors onto a map and see where they actually live or, or all kinds of other fun things like that. And then he'll go into some crazy examples for those who are a bit more code centric who want to talk about visualization libraries and the like. So that one is going to be over at the Hive, which uh, is actually basically across the street from Woodward's, our old space. And so come join us there. We'll hang out there for two months. And then as I said, we'll mix it up a little bit. But we have been really busy over the Christmas holidays. Good Lord. So. Uh, We've decided Vancouver, nice place and all, but uh, the valley's where the action's at. I hear agreement, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like someone to say, like, yeah. death first. <laughs> so,
So we have definitely been very Vancouver centric, um, and and we sort of left some of our friends who couldn't be part of this. So we are going to do a couple experiments. Experiment number one is we are for the next year going to be working with Gary Kovacs, who has been a longtime supporter. He's moved to Abbotsford, and he has agreed to do an event every two months, starting the first one in February. And so we're going to have our second regular meetup within the Metro Vancouver area. I'm super excited. We will be syndicating a little bit of what we've done here. So we'll do a Google Analytics event with him in February, like third week. And then we'll probably take the crowdfunding panel we did in October here in Vancouver and bring that to the Abbotsford community. We are also going to do an event on June 25th. We just locked it down today. We'll be at the Surrey Central Library, new and fancy, to go just to check out this library. And that'll be with uh, Darren Barefoot and Ms. 604 slash Rebecca Bolwin. So it's going to be like heavy hitters coming and uh, starting up something in Surrey. The reason we're doing this is we're going to do two Surrey events with the goal of finding a local partner who can help sustain that on an ongoing basis. So if you know people in Surrey who might be interested in working with us on to do regular Tuesday style events within Surrey, send them my way. Because I'd love to sort of talk to people and say, like, how do we collaborate, find the right venue, find the right partner to do something on at least a quarterly basis, which is my goal. And by the way, there's now a NetSquared Abbotsford uh, group, so you can find that on Meetup. This is also your chance to share about the cool things you're doing in the community. Um, if you come up here and, and talk to people, I'll give you 30 seconds. So I know for sure that our friend Amanda wants to start in on this one. Yeah. Um, the rest of you, come right here, and I'll queue you up, and you have 30 seconds to share the cool thing you're doing in this community. Thanks, Eli. Um, I'm Amanda from, I work at the City of Vancouver, and if you're interested in being a bureaucrat as well, um, we're going to be uh, uh, posting a position for a social media person full-time permanent coming up, so uh, keep an eye out for that. We're also working on a digital strategy right now, and one of the things, we had a really interesting conversation with the Seniors Association, or the Seniors Advocacy, uh, whatever they're called, citizens, uh, um, group and they, yeah, access and training and all that kind of stuff is definitely um, identified as a big need. That's probably more than 30 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> <Good. laughs> Don't lie to me. I know you're doing something interesting right now. This loss. All right, all right. Yeah, the cool thing. Who else has got like something interesting that's going on? Right now? Come tell us. Hey, I'm John. Uh, I'm a recovering startup entrepreneur. <laughs> um, actually, I'm now a freelance writer. I write for Tech Five. So I also write for Huffington Post. So I like to write stories about people and business with purpose. So. I'm always looking for interesting stories, interesting businesses, so I'll share your lies, lies, and more lies <laughs> here right now. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> Come on, uh, you guys all work for mission-based organizations. I know you're doing amazing stuff, so don't be shy. Come on, I want two more people. 